everybody, welcome back. And I hope you've enjoyed your lunch and you've taken the opportunity to meet and network and talk to each other. You're in the OER and Others track. And in Cinema One today, we're going to start off with uh, Wikimedia in Residence from the University of Oxford, an all-round great guy, because he certainly helped me get going in Wikimedia, editing in Wikimedia, and that is Martin Porter. So I will hand over to Martin. Thanks very much. Hi, so I'll start my talk by going back historically to how I see the OER, what we did in the OER movements, because having been involved in the, the funded UK OER projects. So there's repurposing existing material, getting material that existed and finding the people who owned it and asking, could we re-license it, please? Could we put it on a different platform? Could we have permission to remix it and make open materials with it? There was funding, uh, creation of original material that was born open and trying to kick academics off in the practice of making open materials, the, uh, efforts to shape top-down institutional policy and uh, make it more friendly to, to the creation of open resources. There was the dissolution of the barrier between the platforms used by academics and the social media platforms used by the hoi polloi. That I'd write down so people did more courses on blogs and Flickr and used those, uh, those kinds of platforms. And then there's the shift from uh, the emphasis on resources to practices. So if we have... Um, the values and practices of remixing of resources uh, embodied in communities and uh, in groups involved in learning, then the, the, the resources will come out of that as a natural process. And I want to talk about, I want to say opening up another front, but maybe the, the military metaphor isn't apt. We're trying to do something that benefits everybody. But the last session talked about what's it, uh, an army of peace, so maybe it is. Uh, but the, I'll say opportunity. There's a huge opportunity, I think additional to other things, in the repurposing of data to make educational objects. Data that was not intended to have an educational purpose initially. So e examples, the data describing the collections in a museum or a cultural institution. Uh, there's data from the outputs of research projects. So this is uh, an archaeological project that surveyed uh, archaeological sites in the British Isles. There's data from the public sector. Not that the, uh, the, the fertility rate of a particular country in a particular month is a learning object, but uh, more of that data, different types of it, given context, put into some sort of interactive platform, makes something like Gapminder, something that people can come and, and interact with and can support learning. So... The disclaimer is I'm not, I, I'm not expecting the computers to do the teaching. I'm talking in this session about resources and easy, ways to ease the production of resources that are interactive and interesting. Um, and data bring with them their own problems. So that, that something is called data and it's in the computer and it's official. It can have a, a seeming authority to it, um, uh, which, of course, data aren't always authoritative or aren't always neutral, that we have more data about certain parts of the world than others. Um, uh, so, so creating objects from data doesn't solve kind of social cultural problems. It brings the traditional problems associated with claims to knowledge and other problems as well. But it's still, we can make things that support a process of learning and make it more interesting, and we can make those things more easy, easily than before. But why, uh, why in particular now? We've had databases for a long time. We've had websites driven by data for a long time. We've had data that's freely accessible and data that you can get through an API for a long time in all these categories. Um, well, there's a problem, of a deep problem of communicating between databases and joining them up. On the screen are the different identifiers in some database for Jane Austen. So she's, uh, for New York Times, she's person slash Jane Austen. For the Women Writers I uh, database, she's 61CA, blah de blah. Uh, so they don't represent the same object in the same way. And if we look at the, um, say, the relationship of authorship, the relationship between a work and a person of authorship. That'll be represented in a completely different way in a library database, in a New York Times database, uh, and so on. 
So uh, the existence of data about different types of data about the same thing doesn't mean we can join up and create something that explores knowledge about that thing. We were told that, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll move on to, to the next slide. So if you're going to make an application like this, since we're in a cinema, I've chosen one based on films, uh, this is a fun application for exploring the relation between books and films. So you can go into, say, Les Miserables, and you'll say Les Miserables is a film based on a book, a book by Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo also wrote this book, and there are lots of films based on this uh, uh, book, Notre Dame. And you can read the text of the books through the Bibliothèque Nationale interface. So to do this traditionally would be a lot of work because you've got to, to model your domain. So how do you represent a person? How do you represent a film? How do you represent a book? How do you describe the relations between the director of a film and a film? Um, and then you've got to enter the data, and then you've got to think about how you'll present it. You've got to make this site which is an interface to what you've made. So that would be the old way to do it. And we were told this problem would be solved. In the initial design for the World Wide Web, there was this idea of the semantic web that uh, there'd be standards and formats through which databases could talk to each other and uh, say, I have information about this thing. Um, and th that's 20 years ago, 20, no, 30 years ago. It's easy to think that that is just hype or vaporware because it was very hyped that it was going to happen and it didn't happen. But I think it is starting to happen, that standards are being adopted, new databases are being created, with, built with a kind of an open format and kind of built to share data with other databases. But a crucial step is the creation of a hub. So back in 1992, Tim Berners-Lee said that about the World Wide Web that the uh, number of documents people could get to the World Wide Web would eventually be absolutely astronomical. People would need to manage that that explosion of information. And one recommendation he made was he, what he called the encyclopedia. So there'd be this site continually updated that you could go to to get, for any topic in arts, sciences, history, culture, an overview of that topic, an introduction, and some pointers to the key research, the key sources in that topic. And there were several attempts to build the encyclopedia that Berners Lee described, and one of them happened to be hugely successful and became Wikipedia, which is kind of the first point of call for, for all sorts of categories of user. So the crucial step for structured data, for the, for the knowledge that's not in a narrative but in the form of a structured database, is having a hub. And that the newest sister project of Wikipedia is Wikidata, which aims to serve that role, a summary of knowledge and culture in structured data, but also a gateway to other uh, sources of knowledge about that same thing. Uh, yeah, some stats about it. So uh, it's five and a bit years old, with currently 46 million things described, including more than four million people. These numbers are already a bit out of date because it's very rapidly growing, but it's already the biggest digital authority files for people ever created. It's already very dense with, um, uh, say, geographical items to have a coordinate location, but what I said, the inequality, that it's, it's not equally all over the world. Um, so this can be a, a kind of central reference point. So I'm going to go through the slides I've shown you backwards. So Wikidata exists, it enables, it has its own visualization tools, its own ways to get data in and out, and it enables, it solves some of this problem of enabling us to create views of a particular domain of knowledge. So this application was actually built in a hackathon using Wikidata. Okay, so um, uh, the IMDB have uh, a database of film posters, uh, Bibliotech Nationale have, a, have an online access to texts. Uh, Wikidata knows which is which, knows where, what the links are to the Internet Movie Database and to the Bibliotech Nationale, and has those based on relations, or has a lot of them. If you spot uh, some that don't exist, you can add them. So what the developer of this has to do is just 
presenter, just how to work out how to present this to users and how the user interacts to it. It, it cuts out a load of the work. Uh, Wikidata has uh, thousands of other databases reconciled to it. So one query gets all of these, and these aren't just identified, these are links. So say the information about um, Jane Austen's grave is at find a grave link number 44. This I put up, this is UNESCO sharing data. Wicked data isn't ideal for time series, but they can be put, so there's lots of uh, like time series like the population of London month by month or economic data month by month. Not all of that goes into Wicked data, but it can go to somewhere that's addressed by Wicked data and we can make gap minder like things. This is a research project in Oxford that I persuaded to uh, share, not the output of their research, but kind of the surface layer of their data. What did they find out about where was it, what's it called, and what type of thing is it? And then we can generate uh, maps, different visualizations of the data. And as well as urging developers to do this, I've had to kind of eat my own dog food in sharing museum data. Uh, which I'll show you briefly. Uh, so we shared a lot of data from a university collection. Those data are ostensibly about a bunch of items, and those items are made of paper, or they're made of wood or bronze, and they're 20 centimetres high or 40 centimetres high, and they're from a particular place. But implicitly, the collection data of museum is about other stuff. It's about... Krishna, Buddha, Ganesha, it's about Mount Fuji, things that are depicted, things that people made these artworks for, for the purposes of or, or to depict. So we can give access to the, uh, the collection in terms of those things. We can use the things that the collection is about for discovery of the collection, and we can get context. So uh, this is the plan of the, the different eras and dynasties and cultures represented in the collection. And because it's all one database, bibliographic, biographical, geographical, we can draw in contextual things. We can draw in other names for the item. We can draw in the extract of the Wikipedia article. So we get a few sentences saying what this is and why it's important. We can get a contextual image. Um, and then build a web. So this era is connected to people, there are works connected to it, it's connected to eras and time. Uh, so people go on the journey through a culture, to a person, to a, a location near a surface, to another person connected to the location, to the works of that location, to what was depicted in the works made in that location. Um, so, yeah, we can create these kind of web structured things that. Uh, people can explore. So when I was uh, doing funded open education resource projects, I was sharing a lot of Microsoft documents, words and PowerPoints on the web, and those were considered uh, educational objects. If I'd done something interactive like that, I would have got tens of thousands of pounds uh, to do it. So um, I think we can think more expansively about applications that give an overview of a domain. I've shown you films and books, and I've shown you Eastern art, and it's basically the same code and the same principles, but we could do that for any domain and let people find their own way through it. Uh, there's a few other things I won't mention. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Histropedia. If you haven't tried Histropedia, have a go at that, uh, which it's another Wikidata and Wikipedia-driven application, and it makes amazing interactive stuff. But finally, I just want to say that... Um, uh, what about the path? These things are very web-like. They have multiple entrance points and an astronomical number of pathways you can take through them. Uh, who decides what path the learner should take? Um, my earliest mem memories of being uh, enraptured in learning are staying up to watch James Burke on Connections and Carl Sagan on Cosmos. And they had these narratives, they, the programs that should take you through the history of ideas or take you through a topic, and it's one person's uh, view of the connection between different concepts. And I thought the open education revolution would be about that, but taking the paternalism out. So you'd have different narratives about a topic, and you'd find your own version by assembling 
different ways. So we could do that. Uh, too much data is still locked away in proprietary platforms or platforms that can't be repurposed. So open data advocacy should be a big part of what we're doing for open education. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to take questions now, very briefly. So if anybody has questions, the wonderful thing about Martin is you learn so much when you listen to him, even for a few minutes. <laughs> On the Open Education SIG webinar collection, Martin did a wonderful webinar for us, which takes you through all things Wiki. So if that's not something or s that you know a great deal about, they've produced some amazing things. And they're very succinctly portrayed within that webinar, very cleverly, um, clearly communicated. Do we have any questions? It's wonderful when somebody takes something so complex. <laughs> I, ju I just want to ask about the last comment you made about James Burke. And um, obviously, it's been very interesting recently because um, Kenneth Clark's civilization thing has been re remade as civilizations. And it's, it's been a, uh, an opportunity to really think about this whole issue of paternalism, interpretation, curation, and whether uh, the interpretation of an individual who knows their way around objects, history, the library, whether you can separate that individual from the content and whether the content can actually stand on its own and you can still sort of find your way through. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about this. Th this is why I said early on that I don't expect the computer to do the teaching, that this thing needs some context, whether it comes from formal or informal learning or whether it's individual curiosity or whether it's uh, something you do in a community or with mentorship and whether the, mentorship, the mentor is present or there's somebody on the TV. There's got to be some context, uh, but um, I hope we, we have an opportunity to get away from the broadcast model because we would tune in to Carl Sagan and James Burke in our millions and watch the one guy giving uh, his, which was great and, and uh, gave us an illuminating journey that we wouldn't have thought of ourselves. But um, yeah, the same facts can sustain multiple narratives and find multiple interesting pathways. So it's creating the opportunity for that but in a context of reliable information. So I've emphasised authoritative sources of information all the way through. So people, as the saying goes, people have a right to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. So taking, so a kind of paternalism in kind of quality, but being ditching the paternalism of the pathway, what's the significance? But, but there is also something in the uh, multiplicity of description of a Lord Clark or a James Burke, that, yeah. that actually they reveal something of themselves and yeah. their own understanding of stuff. And I'd like to see other people yes. revealing something of themselves, people from a different culture or a different... Uh, yeah, yeah my, my education was, it was a quality education, but it was from particular points of view. And in adult life, I'm learning about different points of view. So I think that's the point you're making as well, yeah. Um, yeah, if we could open up the, as much of the, yeah, the cultural material and let people create their own stories, their own narratives. Hi, Martin. Um, what's the equivalent? You know, on Wikipedia, there's the whole kind of deletist version, includer version. You know. what, what's the equivalent of that in Wikidata? So there is a notability criterion for Wikidata, as there is Wikipedia. It's much more lax for Wikidata. So Wikipedia, it's got to be substantially covered in three, at least three reliable sources. Wikidata is for things that are... Um, are in a reliable source, are described in a reliable source, there has to be some rich description. So I don't think I could put some museum uh, catalogue record, say, like textile fragment from somewhere in India, purpose unknown. And you couldn't put that, but something which has properties and if exists in some official register, if it's a person, an exhibit, a book, whatever, that can be in. So that's why there's 46 million things in, in Wikidata at the moment, and there could easily be 100 million uh, it's rapidly expanding, whereas you know, much larger numbers than you get in any individual Wikipedia. Thanks, guys. I'm going to rush Thanks Martin away, but do catch him. He's here today and tomorrow, I believe. Suzanne. Suzanne Kossiu is going to talk to us now about research 